What's going on, everybody? It's Frito here for your Overwatch with a news roundup video today. The internet was stirred up into a bit of a frenzy where Overwatch diehard players and haters alike were kind of offended by IGN's 2020 updated review of the game, giving it a 10 out of 10 masterpiece, garnering them nearly 5,000 dislikes. The video definitely was a bit of a love letter to the game, quickly washing over any slight criticism and not really seeming to have a deep understanding of it, praising game mechanics like Brigitte's shield with very flowery language, emphatically saying that all of the post-launch maps have been a success. This comment says, yeah, about that. I mean, they've taken a few of them out of competitive rotation, so I don't even know if they agree with you, IGN, on that one, and washed away problems like the double shield meta, calling it a new puzzle to solve for the player base rather than an incredibly obnoxious and lame way to play the game, so much so that drastic balance changes have come through. And and here's the funny thing, as much as I'm agreeing much with the negative clap back to the review itself, I wouldn't say my feelings on the game are far away from the sentiments they're trying to portray, but this is what happens when a mainstream journalist who doesn't really know anything about the competitive game itself, perhaps doesn't even play it, has a very rosy view of it, because the more casual attitude you approach to a game, the easier it is to just ignore or not even notice some of its major flaws. And, well, as I've said in the past, my love and appreciation for Overwatch has gone up because I've really lowered my expectations of its competitiveness. To be fair to IGN, just about every news outlet and content creator in 2016 was speaking about Overwatch this way back then. But the sentiment of the community and the player base at large has kind of had a reality check to the limits that the game has set for itself. I found this a bit funny because around when the new year kicked in a few months ago, I made a review of the game myself, sort of reestablishing where I felt the game was at. And I think there is a lot of things to be very optimistic about, but still more work to be done to really solidify Overwatch's longevity as a competitive game rather than just a fun one. I still think Overwatch is the most fun game around. Valorant has come through and now has all of the rose-tinted glasses, honeymoon phase, attention towards it. People are severely overlooking Valorant's flaws right now, and the the same thing happened to Overwatch. With enough time, players sort of wise up to these things and learn what they don't like about it. But even after all these years, I would say Overwatch is a more fun game than Valorant for sure, like no question. Valorant may be able to achieve some more competitive integrity than Overwatch can, but I think the devs can make moves to improve that over time, especially with the launch of the sequel, I'm hoping. And when those annoyances are ironed out, I think a bigger percentage of players will return to being as cheery as the IGN review was about things like the character and sound design, the buttery smooth gameplay, high action, just the raw fun of it. Otherwise, in the news, Blizzard made a public statement about BlizzCon saying that it will be canceled this year. However, it will be replaced with a virtual event of a kind. They haven't really gone into detail on what that's going to be, but it's going to be slated for early next year rather than the end of this one. Does this change my confidence level of when Overwatch 2 will be released? Maybe, because here's the thing. Lots of companies have been pulling out of E3 and these big conventions because truth be told, doing anything online generates its own buzz. There just isn't really that much value to combining it into a convention necessarily when the online marketing does about the same thing. In fact, if you look at how Blizzard has been managing BlizzCon, they've been trying to add more and more premium items for the attendees in order to try to recoup some of the costs of putting the show on. This, to me anyway, indicates that Blizzard as well is seeing how inflated the event has become, and I don't think anybody in marketing really thinks that a physical event does more than just releasing a trailer online or something. It's been years since that has mattered, but of course the event is fun. I've gone the last few years, I love going, but I don't necessarily think they couldn't announce Overwatch 2 in its own separate announcement from this virtual event, but seeing as they did state the time window of when it would likely come, perhaps they are looking for an early 2021 release for Overwatch 2. I think that would be a mistake, and I hope that doesn't end up happening, but if they like to keep all of their 
entities together and kind of sync up when they announce everything, that does seem to make sense. So I could see it going either way at this point. From my standpoint, the irons are hot for this end of year launch window. And if they miss it, I don't think Overwatch 2 is going to hit the same heights as it otherwise might. Perhaps Activision has the confidence of the hype level that Overwatch 1 generated, kind of regardless of these key launch windows, and thinks that no matter when they release, that they sort of can draw attention to it no matter what. But I don't know if there's as much enthusiasm for the sequel than it was in the 2015 era, where announcing a new IP from Blizzard was a much bigger deal. Only time will tell. Let me know your thoughts on this in the comment section down below. Last up, some esports news. Monte Cristo, on the Cloud9 channel interviewed three Overwatch coaches and analysts. In it, they talked about the success of the May Melee tournament and potential format changes to the Overwatch League. Monty reveals that a tournament system was one of his ideas that he was attempting to sell the management on before he left, which, by the way, is similar to how the COD Pro League does it, another Activision property, which is why I think it's obvious that Overwatch is likely going to go to that route, especially after seeing success with with the main melee anyway, but the viewership has basically doubled either because of the improved format where the games actually have stakes going through a tournament, who knew, or because now you can actually farm owl tokens, although it is a bit convoluted to do so. You have to sign in on the Overwatch League website or app and then watch the YouTube through that embed. And it's just, it's kind of weird and hard to do. So who knows how many viewers actually were just farming tokens instead of actually watching the games, but either way, the viewership did increase. The podcast also talked about the problems of the homestand model that is above and beyond just the state of the world, not being able to travel as much. Even early on in the season, before the events were canceled, it felt like the sustainability simply wasn't there. Because the venues aren't stadium-sized like a normal sports league, the league isn't really pulling in the money to send players around in private jets to lower the travel time. And really, when you have five home stands in Washington and they're a bad team, possibly one of the worst in the league, well, fans aren't just gonna keep showing up to watch them lose every week. Instead, they kind of came to, in the podcast, it would be great to see regional group play maybe localized without a lot of travel or an event and then have these regular tournaments where a particular team might be hosting it but it's more of a overall overwatch event rather than just a regular league match of any given week for the regular season i certainly hope that's the way it goes because the regular season format just makes a disproportionate number of games be about teams that aren't very good whereas in a tournament they get bounced out and longtime esports fans like myself we're not used to being forced to watch bad teams play and a lot of us just choose not to. There was also talk about the effects of not having hero pools in this tournament. Every hero was available and praising the amount of diversity we saw. However, I think if you look at it a bit more critically, you would notice that some styles were effective until the enemy team knew how to beat it, right? Like Valiant could play a rushdown comp until they played the Shock who knows how to kite with the spam meta comp and Valiant got dominated so hard, I don't think teams would continue to play Rush if they stayed on this format. I feel a lot of discussions about this, people aren't actually honest about the effects that different formats have and have very optimistic viewpoints like, well, if all the heroes are available, surely more comps will hold on a sec. Have you watched Overwatch for the past four years before hero pools? I don't like hero pools either, and I'd rather they be gone at this point rather than nothing, but I think the best format would be some sort of ban system. Maybe banning DPS is somehow made easier or done more than banning supports and tanks, which have more meta strength on the different types of comps you can run. I don't know, but I think if the tournament taught us anything, it's that loser pick vastly improves gameplay, and I think it would be the strongest endpoint for competitive Overwatch if there was some agency on the bans as well, because otherwise I'm fully confident that less and less heroes are going to be viable as time goes on, given a unrestricted format, because teams just learn how to adapt using the best heroes. It's happened time and time again, and I think if you look hard enough, you'll notice that it did happen as the tournament went on. Which, by the way, is typical of competitive Overwatch since its inception in these tournaments. When Ana Nano Boost was insane, teams were trying to run it on the Reinhardt every single fight until they realized that the speed boost on Reaper was massively OP, and then all of a sudden we had the Beyblade meta, right? Almost in an instant, when it gets ran on someone, you can realize, oh my god, that strategy is way more powerful 
powerful than what we're doing. And I think those lessons get taught very harshly and swiftly in Overwatch. And then before you know it, in a couple of weeks, everyone's got to be playing the same thing because everyone just figured out the way to adapt to any counter meta strategies. So as always, let us know your thoughts on all of this in the comment section down below. That's going to be it for today's news roundup video. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to leave it a like. It really does help us out. Let's us know that you're enjoying the content. And if you haven't already, hit subscribe and hit the bell icon to actually get notified when our videos go live. That's been it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. We'll see you guys next time.